everyone. I am Carmen Zabono, and thank you for joining us today on El Multintana, featuring conversations with people who do extraordinary things, each guest sharing his or her passions, experiences, and accomplishments. Our guest today is multi member Ms. Nicolette Conti, also known as Nikki. She is a New York-based street photographer. Her photography creates compelling narratives and intriguing ways of looking at streets. She often uses light, natural, she often uses natural light to create visual aesthetics and painterly effect. During the COVID era, she also used the streets to reflect her own personal sense of solitude and grief. Nikki will be showing a selection of her street work as well as images from New York during lockdown series. Many in our multi-center community might not know this, but many of the photographs on the website and photo gallery were taken by Nikki, who over the years captured the vibrancy of our center. Welcome, Nikki. Thank you for joining us today. Hi. Good morning, New Yorkers. Good evening, Malta. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a bit about your background and where you grew up and how New York City became your home. Sure. Uh, I grew up in Malta. I was actually born and brought up in Malta, and I left about 16 years ago. But I think I'm here initially. I actually went to live in the UK for about six years. So um, from there, I came here in New York. So I've been here just uh, um, about eight years. Yeah, so New York is home right now. So how did this passion develop with photography and what does it mean to you? Yeah, um, it's a bit of a funny story how I started photography. Um, I was in New York and uh, it was probably my second or third year here. And um, my parents and my aunt visited uh, during that May. And um, I have to tell the story because it's really, really funny how I started photography. Um, and uh, my parents and my aunt were out and about on tours, you know, and I, I used to meet them after work. And my aunt used to show me, you know, pictures of, of her tours and they were all blurred and almost hardly getting anything in the photos. Like, aunt, you're not really getting anything in these photos. I can't see anything. She said, yeah, I know I'm crap at taking photos. She said, just here, take my camera. Whenever you're going around with us, just shoot and shoot some photos for us. So I did. And at the end of the two weeks, she was really pleased with what I shot, just like shooting everywhere with them and stuff. And before she left, um, she had um, $200 and she just gave me the money. She gave me the cash in my hand and she said, just go and buy yourself a good camera. My dear, you're really good at photography. I was like, what? <laughs> Two months later, I went and I bought my first digital professional uh, camera, which cost $2,000. And um, that was the start of my photography. I was never really quite into it. I did take photos with my really baby digital camera when I used to do my travels around. But I wasn't really uh, thinking of, you know, taking it as a, as a hobby. And um, eventually it actually became my passion. So yeah, so I was back in 2014, but I must say it was a really long journey into getting where I am now. It was a, a lot of like a, a long learning curve, understanding how the camera works, all the techniques. I took a variety of courses, um, but it was fun all the way, I must say. That's what I wanted to ask you. Like, um, you know, so this was back in 2014 that you started on this path to photography and um, along the way now, you've established yourself as a street photographer. And how, how, did, how, did, how did that come about? Like, you know, some people become portrait photographers or uh, architectural photographers. How did you end up um, in the genre of street photography? Yeah, actually, it's a good question. Um, initially, as I said, I, I was experimenting with every type of photography. I mean, I did portraiture, I even did a whole six to eight week course at the ICP, particularly on photojournalism and photo documentary. Um, so I kind of delved into documentary photography, but I, I started a bit of street photography, almost like a, um, a natural course of way because of me living in, in New York. And it kind of also was the thing, you know, to be doing a bit of that. Um, but then I actually um, met and had a course with Alan Scheller. He's one of the top international street photographers. 
who was visiting New York back in 2018. And I got to know and um, about him coming and he was organizing a course over a weekend. And that weekend in October just almost like um, changed, you know, my way of thinking at least about street photography. And I fell in love with it. I just wanted to focus on street photography from then on. It took me a while again to find that kind of uh, voice or style in how I would capture the street. But then I started learning, you know, through other street photographers, what do they capture? How do they capture? And there's always a variety. Mm -hmm. um, I, I seem to like acclimate towards the, the old school kind of street photographers, which started in the 50s and the 60s with Gordon Parks, Gary Winogrand, Rob, Robert Frank. But then I kind of started also putting a, a contemporary spin to my street photography and really trying to understand the use of light and mm -hmm. natural patterns in the urban environment. So that, you know, like after a lot of experimentation, a lot of practice, I started kind of fine tuning my street photography. Right. Yeah. So I, 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 you know, since I've known you for quite a while and I've seen, you know, the progression in your photography and um, dealing with the photos um, when doing the website, a lot of it to me was kind of more portrait photography yeah. um, when you were capturing, um, you know, what was going on at the center and um, over, you know, the past few years, I saw how it's transitioned um, from, you know, portraiture and the color photography and then come mm -hmm. into the black and white, you know, the use of the negative uh, space. Mm -hmm. Um, which you'll be presenting shortly um, near New York City on lockdown, where we, we will see this uh, style that you have. Um, and going into the New York City during lockdown and the photography, um, it, it shows the, how significant photography is in your life. And in this collection, you're going to show us how personal it is to you and it's, how it's all intertwined. Um, just tell us a little more about that. Yeah, um, I must say the lockdown had obviously an impact on everyone, including myself. Um, I never thought actually of, you know, starting kind of a project on shooting New York during lockdown. Um, everything happened uh, so quickly, so suddenly. Um, I actually had quit my job in February with the intention to travel around South America for two months. And I had started that journey early March only to get back from Colombia on the ninth day. And when I got back, it was actually uh, shy of a few days when then New York started, officially started its lockdown. And um, those weeks and days were, you know, um, were quite like eerie, strange. I, I was like trying to understand, you know, what's happening with the pandemic, obviously getting overly worried, overthinking about everything. Um, you know, I, I was without a job, so obviously my thoughts were all over the place. And um, it took me a few weeks to kind of adjust to, to this big change, you know, lockdown and, and sheltering in place and being alone and um, adjusting to a new life, basically. And then, I, I, you know, after a few weeks, I was like then kind of getting bored also, because as I said, I was without a job and... Um, I was like missing uh, shooting. My camera was practically gathering dust. I was like, <laughs> yeah, this is not good. So I decided to start walking about and I started walking about my neighborhood and then extended my walk walks to Roosevelt Island until I actually got into the city. And obviously I, I carried my um, Fuji with me, my baby Fuji, and, which is my kind of street photography camera. And that's when I started shooting. It wasn't really a planned project, but I, I felt like um, I was kind of in a way on a, on a mission to understand what's happening around me, but at the mm -hmm. same time to really understand um, what is going on and how to make, try to make sense of things and what I was actually going through, you know, being alone um, in isolation, far away from friends and, and family, which I was missing even more. Um, so yeah, so that's how it kind of started. So did you feel like um, when you embarked on this uh, venturing out with the camera um, during COVID that it was going to offer you some relief as well? Um, to be honest, uh, no, I didn't think of it that way, um, mm -hmm. but it ended up being that way. Um, it was like almost um, processing 
a variety of emotions. Um, we know when I was out there and um, shooting and coming across, you know, what you see and who you see, how you see things. Um, in the end, it was like um, it, ironically kind of comforting because, you know, I saw the city in a way that really attuned to how I was feeling alone, isolated, abundant. Um, so there was like that relationship or rapport that, you know, I had a sense with the city about. Um, it's, it's people or the few people at least that I, I saw about, you know, it's buildings, the streets. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, in the end, it kind of offered a, a way, uh, a, a relief in, in a way. But I must say, photography um, is even more than ever allowing me to be creative, but more so express myself in ways that it's hard for me to express even verbally at times and mm -hmm. in ways that I find maybe some people can't even understand what I would be going through. And, and photography helps me. Um, basically share, try to share or try right. to so it's an, an, an extension yeah. for you, what you cannot say in words. And this is what this platform is going to be wonderful because now you can actually explain to everyone here um, the photos that you're ready to present this extension of your feelings behind the photos. Yes. So, so this is actually going to be the first time ever that I'm probably going to say uh, the story behind a few of the photos that I took. Mm -hmm. And despite that, some photos, um, if some people here follow me on Instagram, some of the, of the photos I'll be showing today are on Instagram, but no one has ever heard the story behind it. So this definitely is gonna be a first time. Do you feel ready now to, you know, I, I, it's, it's a, you know, for me, I feel like, this, you know, it's, it's a very personal story and that you're going to be um, explaining your feelings behind these photos. Um, so, are you ready? Yeah, yeah, right. I'm ready. If everyone is ready. Okay, to we're, and also start. everybody, in case we lose connection, please be patient. If the slide share uh, fidgets a little, just be patient. We're, we've run a practice run, but as you know, technology, just be patient with us. <laughs> okay, so I am gonna start sharing my screen. Okay, is everyone seeing my screen? Awesome. All right. So, um, yeah, so as I was saying, uh, it was started by walking around my neighborhood. So the first few photos that we see is actually around Astoria. And then we see a few photos from Roosevelt Island until then the rest are basically um, photos that I captured in the city. Um, the photos that we'll see actually are captured um, between late March and mid-May. And the city was officially in lockdown from the 28th of March till the 15th of May. Um, yeah, so let's start. So this was in Astoria Park very early in the morning. I think it was around 6 a.m. late March. Um, you know, I started going around my neighborhood. I was not sure where to go. I just literally walked the streets until I got to the park, which is not far from where I live, about maybe a mile. And um, when I got to the park, I started noticing a few people, you know, running and doing some exercises. And I noticed this woman, she was actually doing some shadow boxing underneath Hellgate Bridge. And I think it was at one point that you know, I started shooting her from obviously quite a distance that I realized that uh, I wasn't the only one to start living this isolated life. And um, I kept wondering, you know, whether um, if it weren't for the pandemic, uh, would she be here out here in this cold 6 a.m. rather than a gym or maybe a shadow boxing class? Um, it was kind of surreal also in a way because uh, when I went home and started editing these photos, uh, you know, and I saw this picture for me, suddenly I realized that the entire world almost like narrowed down into like a keyhole. 
This was taken at uh, Wellington Court, um, again, an area of my neighborhood, Astoria. Wellington Court is really known for its uh, mural art, beautiful mural art. art. And um, at the corner of one of these buildings, that there's this beautiful broken glass collage. And I knew of it. And um, I was bored one afternoon. I had not started working again. And um, it came to mind. I was like, I need to go back there and maybe, you know, try to, to see whether I can get some reflective shots of this broken glass collage. So I went there and um, I waited for at least half an hour. There was no one on the streets and I still shot obviously a, a few shots. And, um, but I was really hoping maybe to catch some, some people on the street. And then I, I went back home and I started editing the shots and I suddenly realized um, that the shape of the collage reminded me of the COVID particle. It's probably because I had seen so many images of the COVID particle across the media that suddenly that conjured to mind. And um, I could see this kind of, um, you know, re almost like a symbol symbolic representation of this particle in, in, the, in its obviously shape and form because of the broken glass shattering our lives. And then to accentuate the fact, that fact actually drained every color from the shots and just made it monochromatic, so black and white. So yeah, so this uh, photo is very, you know, kind of representative of the COVID-19 part again and how it actually shattered our lives and society. So this is on Roosevelt Island Bridge and it was very early in the morning, probably around seven uh, in April. Uh, I was walking across the bridge obviously to get to Roosevelt Island and I caught sight of this construction worker in his highlighted jacket. And uh, I could see a bunch of uh, construction workers all waiting on the other side uh, of the riverbank. So he was probably going out there to meet them and start their construction their day of construction. So it was however beautiful with the light on the on the cage mesh and everything else. Like there was kind of a, like a symphony to it. So when I went home and I started editing, um, I created this kind of like a tunnel vision effect, narrowing onto the worker who was right there ahead of me. And for me, this photo is symbolic of the workers who were out there um, and not being sheltered in lockdown and who I were kind of in a way in the eye of the storm, in the eye of the virus, basically. So this photo metaphorically represents for me all those workers who were on the front line and were very much unsheltered like we were. This was also taken on Roosevelt Island, probably the same morning in April. Um, it was a, a rain puddle reflecting the power plant and a used glove, which was perfectly situated at the, at the bottom of the chimney's reflection. Um, unfortunately, you know, we started seeing more gloves and masks on the ground. And um, what I, I thought about the scene was the um, way of how the world was afflicted with a pandemic, but at the same time, we're also dealing with, you know, critical environmental issues. So it was like a, a hodgepodge of things in this one puddle reflection that I saw. And then finally, I got into the city. This was late April. And I believe this is uh, 36th Street on Lexington. Um, it was empty. Um, it was just a shock to see the streets. I mean, I had seen um, quite a few uh, photos um, from street, other street photographers that I follow of such empty streets, but you had to be there to believe it. And um, I actually got the ferry into the city rather than the subway uh, that day. And eventually through the course of, of the lockdown, just to avoid, you know, people and enclosed areas. So I walked from the East Bank over to here, uh, Lexington and 34th. And it was so early, quiet, uh, no cars, barely any people. It was literally something like out of like a, an apocalypse movie or, or, or a zombie movie. And you expect like a zombie to come out and, and you know, whatever, jump on you at any point. I'm going to um, just... Uh, uh interject here just sure. to answer people who aren't from New York City this block which is also a neighborhood I grew up in is um, it's facing south on 34th 
I mean, sorry, 35th Street looking to 34th and Lexington. It's one of the most busy intersections in the city as it leads to a tunnel. Um, so there's always traffic here, even if it's three o'clock in the morning, there's, oh, there, there would be cars, people, it's rarely ever quiet. Um, so it's, to me as a New Yorker, it's a very striking photo and also it's a childhood neighborhood for me. Um, so I just wanted to give a little backdrop for people who aren't from New York, the impact of this photo um, on, on what I'm seeing. Um, go ahead, go ahead, Nikki. Sure. Yeah, thanks for that additional information. Definitely useful. Um, yeah, so I I was obviously in awe and then uh, struck by this. And um, in the eight years I had been living in New York, I, ha I had never seen anything like this. And it happened within such a short period of time, you know, within less than two months that it was like uh, spellbound, spellbinding. So it's, um, I kept telling myself, it's like, what am I going to shoot? You know, how am I going to capture the city? Um, I was obviously going through a lot of emotions here um, and, and I was really kind of at a loss and it took me a few more kind of visits to the city to understand and, and kind of maybe um, dissipate a bit my emotions to maybe start shooting in some ways and, and try to capture the city as, as it was. So it ended up, um, I actually produced this photo, which is obviously kind of a contemporary ab abstract spin to it. Um, I obviously wanted to capture the voidness or the emptiness of the streets. I love black and white photography, but I only use it uh, in, in aspects that I think are um, lender ways in the context of the image that I'm capturing. So in this case, what happened was I shot the, um, a photo of the street um, across from west to east, probably along the lines of 34th Street. And um, I, I noticed that the street was so empty that you could actually see the traffic lane line in the middle of the road all the way, three blocks, approximately three blocks, that would be um, about half a mile until you get sight of that street steam chimney very clearly. So when I went back home and started editing, I really accentuated and highlighted the mm. traffic lane, light, lane li line. Um, to really, uh, you know, help people understand how empty the streets the streets were. I would have never been able to either shoot or produce this photo if New York wasn't in lockdown, and not even at night, because cars and people they are constantly, usually and generally, constantly going and and, and moving. So this was kind of a, a, a one in a million kind of uh, shot and and way to edit um, such a, a capture. This was Bryan Park on a Sunday morning, late April. Um, I love that park. And um, so I went and visited the park and what struck me was that the chairs and the tables were all laid out. I had been to other parks um, or like public uh, spaces and squares before and all the chairs were stacked. So I was like, this is interesting. Um, and there was no one around. There was just one um, other man sitting on a, a, at a chair and table there and no one else, just me. Um, so I, I had this like, uh, I, I was like attracted by the shadows of the, of the chairs. And that's why here I got the shadows because it was like uh, the sun was really elongating their shadows in a way that it was person personifying their longing to be sat on. You know, um, and as I was walking around the park and across these shadows, it was almost as if they were reaching out to me saying, we miss humans. What use are we with no humans here? Um, it, was, it was kind of like a, a surrealist moment, which I hope to have captured in this image. I, 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 when I see this, um, I, I feel like the, the chairs are having a conversation with themselves you know, they're all alone yeah. and they only have themselves and there's like, you know, the, they're not orderly, you know, they're kind of, uh, you know, yeah, here and there. So I feel like there's a conversation going on in this, you know, alone seats, but there's yeah. an energy to me when I see this. Yeah, it's almost as if they resorted to having a chat with one another because obviously there, right. there are no people around. Right. 
So this was at the foot of the Empire State Building sometime early May. Um, I had to wait several minutes uh, across the road to try to capture a person or a few people within this frame shot. Sometimes it's something that I do. Um, I just go on in the city, you know, choose a corner and stay there and try to understand what's happening, what's going on, um, kind of frame the scene mentally and then kind of wait for the right moment. Um, and then finally, I saw a woman crossing from the other end and patiently waited until she perfectly fit in the middle of those you know, two isolated images of the Empire State building over there. Um, it was a kind of a stark contrast how before the pandemic, before lockdown, um, whenever I did my street photography, I actually had to wait for scenes to declutter and, and um, less people to be there. I was always drawn to minimalism and that's what I kind of tried to portray in my street photography. So I, I was never into, you know, capturing the bustles and the, and the big crowds and the many people in one frame. I, I always aim for isolation, minimal number of people, uh, loners, and so on and so forth. Probably because, again, they relate to, to me or how I relate to them on, on the scene. But the, but the stark contrast with the pandemic is, on, on the contrary, I had to wait sometimes even half an hour to an hour for someone to come into my picture. So it was like everything was in reverse. Incredible. Not to say, obviously, that there was no one at the foot of the Empire State Building. This is usually one of the places that is most, you know, like populated, especially with tourists wanting to go into the building and going up to the observatory and, and stuff of the sort. So um, in reviewing my photographs uh, and my walkabouts, I obviously, my eyes were drawn to projections of my own isolation. Uh, the lone buildings, structures, um, the lonely empty streets, solitary figures, souls like myself wandering about. So the next few photos, you will see like the singular person um, walking about the, the street and uh, basically how and where I captured is, is kind of interesting as I walked about. In this case, um, this guy was coming down, walking towards Union Square. And um, obviously I couldn't help notice that, you know, what he was wearing all black with a white mask blended so well with this kind of monochromatic outfit that the city was donning at that point. Obviously bar the orange um, traffic cone. This was on uh, Fifth Avenue. And this is one of the most famous shopping streets uh, in New York, if not the world. And all the outlets and stores were, were shut and there was no one around. And uh, I just got sight of this guy casually strolling by in his orange trainers, you know, shorts, mask, just uh, passing by one of the biggest diamond stores, you know, in New York, Harry Winston. Um, I got sight of this, uh, this guy walking his dog. I actually started coming across quite a few people <laughs> walking their dogs. I think it was almost like an excuse to get out and um, obviously get some fresh air. And um, as I looked across the road, I, what immediately struck me was the similarity between the man and the dog's silhouette. Um, and the side profile of the man wearing the mask almost matched the dog's snout. It's a funny thing, but it became quite a common sight as more New Yorkers wore masks. And here's a guy um, strolling on his rollerblades on an empty sidewalk. And what struck me was um, kind of the sense of abandonment, especially with Dwayne Reed, which is a very uh, popular chain, pharmacy chain here in New York, being shut. Generally, Dwayne Reed would be open 24 hours. And um, yeah, it, this, this image definitely says a lot about how, unfortunately, New York um, was almost like abundant and was actually truly abundant as quite a few residents actually had left during the pandemic. Um, but, you know, as the stores were shut and people were sheltering in, um, you know, more stuff gathered on, on the streets and people like this guy maybe took advantage of, you know, taking up their rollerblades because obviously there are no cars so they could basically stroll whether it's on the curb or, or on the street. 
So when you're taking these photos, did you feel that um, you wanted a human in it or it just happened? I mean, you know, yeah. Um, knowing that, you know, I, I know you take a lot of um, architectural photography as part of your street photography. Do you always, when you did this, did you always want a, as a human subject in, in this? Were you always waiting for that or it just happened? I think most of the time during the pandemic, it just happened. It's because um, of the lack of people. So to be honest with you, when, when I saw someone, it immediately attracted my attention. And then I would quickly observe um, where and how, you know, what the scene is and um, at what point to, to capture the person within that scene. At other times, I... I, I, I basically saw a scene and, and then literally sat there or squatted there for a few minutes to, you know, wait for people to come into the scene. So it was a, it was a bit of a mix. But I think I kind of wanted to have that, those solitary figures in my, in my photos. Probably, again, because I, I was feeling so lonely and I was kind of trying to attune to New York as a city. And a city is obviously made of people, not just the buildings. And how were the people doing? What were they doing? Where were they? Um, I think that curiosity, you know, I needed to kind of kill that curiosity by understanding um, yeah, what was happening in the city versus what was happening with me and inside me. It's like trying to find a common ground in a way. So this was in Wall Street at the Trinity Church Cemetery. Um, unfortunately, as we know it, death became such a close and frequent visitor given the pandemic and unfortunately it is still. And I passed by the cemetery. Um, I couldn't help, uh, you know, looking without uh, shuddering. It's like uh, that eerie feeling again. But the sunlight fell so gracefully on the tombstones and the green spring grass that, you know, kind of the scene appeased me in, in a way. And it was soothing in some some respects. So I decided to stop, take it all in and then take a picture. It's a very simple image, which is basically framed by the bars of the uh, cemetery gate. That's why it's got this kind of uh, circular shape effect. But I must say uh, an image that says a thousand words for sure, especially during a pandemic. This is downtown. Um, many businesses not only were shut, but they started also boarding up their doors and their windows. Um, unfortunately, in anticipation of a possible looting, which actually uh, happened, I think a couple of weeks after I took this shot. Um, at that moment, this beautiful white pigeon just flew right into the scene and I managed to capture it. And for me, it kind of symbolizes kind of like a, a wild hope against this shutdown scene. This is uh, the Federal Hall, again in downtown. I love this building, um, probably because it reminds me of the, the ones in, back in Europe and the Mediterranean with its beautiful columns. And the light was falling so beautifully, outlining you know, the columns and the stairs. So I waited there for quite a while just to capture the right moment. So I could, again, you know, have some people in the scene. And um, I saw this woman coming from across. Um, she was all, all dressed up in heels, swinging her arms. She was just like walking on a catwalk with the mask. I was like, wow, she's definitely going for it, you know, like almost wanting to, to live the normal life. <laughs> and she definitely got my attention. So um, I shot her and then as I was shooting, and she passing by a delivery guy on his bike, you know, whisked past through from the other side. And that basically made the shot. Mary just uh, wanted to let you know, it looks like a sure. Bird Hopper painting. Oh, Edward Hopper. Yeah, there's one of my <laughs> favorite yeah. art, uh, painters. Yeah, I look a lot at his art and um, it definitely conveys, by the way, a lot of kind of solitary images mm -hmm. and feelings. Yeah. Um, yeah, as, as we, as a, as a lockdown wore down, people started to take any type of wheel device um, other than walking about on foot in New York. So people on scooters, electric scooters and bikes almost became the norm. Um, and this kind of is a 
kind of, in a way, a classical shot of a guy on his bike in the middle of, of the road. Um, I got his silhouette just because of the way uh, the shadow of the skyscraper was, you know, reflecting back on the street. And this is the Oculus. Uh, for those who don't know, the Oculus is um, brand new-ish buildings. Um, it's a huge train station underneath the World Trade Center. And um, it's very beautiful, it's very modern. It's like uh, what they call even the Mohican because it's, it's got this like um, jutting out style in a way. And there's a, a very kind of a short time window in the morning in spring, generally around 9.30 to 10.30 to really get the best shots uh, of the Oculus. It's because of the sun um, reflecting from an adjacent skyscraper onto this building. So it basically um, creates this beautiful light pattern of lines and, and weaved uh, patterns on the building and around it. So shooting away, um, obviously always involved how this building was built and the light falling on it. And I was kind of, again, hoping to get, you know, like a person in, in the frame and I was almost giving up and I started walking away. And then a woman ran past me. Uh, she was running and, you know, doing her jog. And I immediately turned and uh, obviously to take a shot of her. And I noticed that she had this white stripes on her leggings and matching jacket. She was wearing all black. It's like, oh my God, perfect. And at that moment, she even stopped to check her phone. And that was my shot, basically. Um, yeah, I love the shot, obviously. And uh, I think it accentuates the geometrical shapes and patterns and the light, it being black and white. And this was on my way back um, in the early days when I was visiting the city. Uh, this is the Atkoch Queensborough Bridge. And uh, the lanes there are empty. The lanes, one is a pedestrian lane and the other one is, is one for the cyclists. So initially I was actually um, coming in by ferry and walking back home. So it was like approximately eight miles. But before we know it, um, especially as the days grew warmer in May, more people started walking about and grabbing their bikes. So um, it was never that empty. And um, I started taking the ferry back home to just to avoid the kind of like crowdness of people on the bridge. I took this actually from the same bridge and um, it was sad to see the city, you know, in the state, empty streets, um, not much life going on, hardly any people. And so it, it was, you know, um, also kind of ironic that this this mesh was was there because I it, for me it was like the city kidnapped by some invisible enemy that was kind of for me that re the representation of that mesh um, you know the city really was uh, speaking to my loneliness and isolation and I, I glad I I do photography and you know took my camera with me and shot these shots because at least I was like uh, somewhat comforted and soothed you know, by, by what I saw, by what I captured, and it really synthesized kind of with me. And then, um, last but not least, this was back at my apartment. Um, I was hanging up out in my balcony as the days grew warmer, and I noticed this girl in the window in the building next to me. Um, obviously, she definitely caught my attention, even the way that, that the window, you know, is all, is all furnished with the curtains, with the tethered blind, the, the toy hanging and dangling there. And I, I dashed in for him to get my camera so I could capture her, but she had <laughs> gone inside. So I always kept my camera prepared. And every time I, I you know, I, I used to check around noon on my lunch break to see whether she was there. And she was. And I grabbed my camera, was ready and took the, the photo. And what I even love about this photo is her kind of forlorn look. She's, she's looking away outside the window. And I was always curious to, you know, I was always curious to see and think like, what is she thinking about? Does she know what's going on in the world? Is she afraid? Um, you know, what would happen to her future? You know, will she be impacted by the pandemic? I had all these questions. And then the family moved out just a couple of weeks actually after I took this shot. So oh, yes, I'm going to stop there and um, maybe we could open up for thoughts or questions on what we've seen. Yeah. 
All right. You can hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. I can All right. So if anyone has any questions, they could send a message or um, raise their hand and I could unmute you. Um, so over how many months were these pictures, these photos taken? Oh, sorry, Lou. Lou has a question. Yeah, I can see Lou has a question. Okay. Hey, Hi. how are you guys? Great. Good to see you. Awesome. Hey, that was really, really entertaining. Thank you oh. very much. I've just, sure. I've just, um, uh, uh, I've just gone to Instagram, looking at all your stuff. So uh, thank you very thank much. You. Um, uh, you know, Nikki, as I was uh, watching your your photos, mm -hmm. I was just so struck by the uh, you know the the almost palpable character of absence and isolation about which you were speaking. I found, for example, the the cemetery image so poignant and 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 so reflective of the uh, environment in which we're living at the moment um but uh, as you probably know there are so many components in our personalities that make up who we are and these are in in a sense in a constant fluid conversation with one another yeah and what i'd like to know as like you I'm someone who's also ethnically Maltese and, and, and very much so. I identify in that way, uh, having only spoken Maltese till I was about five. Um, what Maltese elements do you think you bring to your photography, right? Is there something mm -hmm. about your experience in Malta that perhaps unconsciously you express as you're framing your your shots yeah it's actually a good question um it probably so unlike you I was actually born and raised in Malta as I said and um I only left when I was 28 years old so you know I did have a life in Malta and I think um leaving Malta and coming to live in these big cities it was almost as if um, sometimes I felt like I had a bit of an identity crisis because I, I was in, in a new place, in a new city, and trying to make sense of things while trying to find myself or rather how I see myself fit into this new environment. So that's why probably it does speak even more to my isolation as in my me being away from my tiny island my original community, my original culture, heritage, people, mm -hmm. and people. And it's like literally feeling that sense of um, uh, de detachment that obviously I did voluntarily, but uh, you cannot help feeling then once you're away. So um, it's probably also how and why my photography speaks to that. It's always about me in the world alone because I was the only one who left Malta so I didn't come with my parents or any other relatives and me trying to make sense of the new environment and me trying to find my identity again in this new environment but the, this new environment is always it takes a while to grow on me and it's it could be a bit daunting obviously because it's so way different than, than Malta obviously I, I know Malta by heart it's a, a small place I know where to go, I know where to find people, I know the people, I know the culture, I know how things operate, everything. But New York is ever, ever so, you know, versatile, it, it's big. Um, obviously, I grew to love it and I, I really synced with it. But again, there's something because probably I'm a, a recent immigrant and have only been here eight years. It's again, probably still trying to figure out things. Where do I fit? How do I fit in this big, grandiose, you know, like, city it's, it's so con condensed and and full of people okay by the pandemic but um yeah i hope that answers your question in a way thanks uh i got some messages on the chat um sure Cia says love this girl in the window photo that was that mm. the tattered blinds and mary uh all beautiful and strong vivid images um, Beth, Vitani, yeah. lovely, all. 
Alexa Care, the young girl in the window is such a beautiful but haunting image. Yeah. Um, Mary, you wanted to? I'm not sure. Did okay. Mary, did you want to speak or? Oh no. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay. Marianne, especially love the one with the white dove. Oh, yeah. Um, Alexia is asking, is the city still so empty after nearly a year of pandemic or are people adjusting kind of? What did you observe in your latest visits there? Yeah, good question. No, the city is not as empty, but it definitely is uh, less full than it was before the pandemic. Um, that, that I noticed for sure, because I, I still go out, I still shoot, um, but there are more people about, but there's like, what, what I noticed is like, there are concentrations of people in certain parts of the city. Uh, and what I also noticed and, um, you know, reading and keeping up with the news is that people are shifting more towards the boroughs. So the boroughs are Brooklyn and Queens. And unfortunately the city is, is again, not as affluent as it was before. As I said, there are pockets where young people are, you know, try together if there's like a, a restaurant offering outdoor dining and, and so on and so forth. East Village, you could see some people there in the streets. Um, again, outdoor dining or just, you know, going out and about living their lives, getting the groceries, st store shopping, whatever it is. But then there are other pockets where the city is, is still bare and empty. I mean, it was amazing during uh, Christmas, Fifth Avenue started picking up and there were more people doing their Christmas shopping. The stores were open. It was great. It was almost as if it was business as usual and there was no pandemic. And then I just decided to go into the um, next uh, avenue parallel to Fifth uh, Avenue, Medicine Avenue, and it was empty. The stores were closed. It was dark. I was almost like a bit scared to walk there. And, and even certain like uh, squares or parks. So Central Park is in a way bustling. There are people running, jogging. Uh, obviously it's kind of the few avenues where, you know, New Yorkers can actually exercise and take a fresh breath of air and stuff. But then as you walk in Union Square, it's empty. It's, and, and, and I was there even in Christmas. I, I thought I would see the market, but there was no one and there was nothing. And unfortunately, I see more homeless um, than ever before. Uh, I have a question, um, comment from, I think it's Caroline. Uh, I was wondering if you plan your shots sometimes, like you organize some of your shoots, stand somewhere and stay there for the right shot, or is it more spontaneous and you never really know what you are going to get? So I do both. I do both. When I, when I do street photography, I feel you, you need to be open um, to whatever happens because you never know what you see or what happens. So spontaneity is, and serendipity is definitely something with street photography. However, I do at times, um, uh, you know, as you said, like uh, stay in a particular place or in a particular area, especially when I see a beautiful scene, you know, all, all the slight and all the, the, I see these patterns and a beautiful frame then yeah, I tend to stay there and just wait for the moment. Um, so yeah, so street photography all in all, I wouldn't say is a, is a planned thing, unlike conceptual photography or photo documentary, which is other types of uh, photographic streams that I, I indulge in and actually do. Those are very much planned, unlike street in general. So among, among the works you, you've just shown us, today, which one really stood out with you the most? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I've got an affinity with most of them. Artistically, probably the Oculus one, um, uh, that definitely stands out from an artistic interpretation. In fact, it got featured in one of the Lens Culture Street Galleries a few months ago. Um, but I think the one that I, I kind of like uh, warm up with is probably also the girl, um, again, because it, 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 it's very, uh, maybe co contemplate a, a lot, um, especially not just about me and my situation, but also about the kids and the impacts on their lives, you know, with this pandemic. 
um, yeah, there's, there's quite an affinity to that image, I must say. Uh, we have a comment from Alexa Kerr. Would you consider taking another set of photos in the same locations once life returns to quote normal and busy again to have a contrast of images? Yeah, um, it's actually a good idea. I probably would. would. In fact, um, I was actually thinking I wish I, I took more pictures uh, on the kind of a business usual basis before the pandemic <laughs> to be able to do that contrast. But who knew that this would happen? So probably yeah, doing it reverse after the pandemic it actually would be an interesting project. Um, I have another from Rita. Love all your photos, Nikki. I related a lot to the photo of 36th Street. It yeah. wasn't just the emptiness, but also the way it's wide, then it gets narrower toward the end. It's similar to the way we all feel closed in. And instead of everything opening up there, is always something new to keep us inside. Riots, pandemic, virus, homelessness, and everyone's scared to be around others. Yeah, I definitely share those thoughts. Thanks for sharing that, Rita. Okay, uh, I think, let me make sure I got all of them. I had a <laughs> stream here and yeah, okay. All right, I think I got it, okay. Cool. Um, so, as you developed your um, photography style, what did you do to um, educate yourself to take better photos and, you know, uh, develop your photography skills? Yeah, that took a while and I'm still trying to <laughs> um, perfect and evolve it. it it's, um, it took quite a while in the sense that I, um, you know, studying how the mechanics of the camera, it's almost like um, driving. And, and that took me a while to understand. And even more because I actually have two cameras. I've got an Nikon and a Fuji. And um, trying to understand the, the content. What am I capturing? How am I capturing in the moment? That's almost like an, a, a different uh, thing to even focus and, and learn. And on top of that is editing. And editing includes everything from sequencing the photos, choosing your best shots, uh, an analyzing your own shots to understand how you could have done better to see whether you've got a trend in your photos and then the actual processing of editing the photos you know color black and white and and, and all of that um so it definitely takes a, a lot of practice and a number of fail fails oh my god when you're out there you know you, you won't have the camera on the right settings or you would have missed on on the right you know, shot or, or whatever. Yeah, it takes a lot of practice and, and doing it over and over and over again. Um, but uh, what I like about photography, as I said, probably it's, a, it's also that spontaneity about it. And um, so that probably drew me to it, but it's spontaneity in a way also um, made me express my individuality in the way, uh, what I capture and then how I also process and edit. And uh, I still love it. And I probably I love it even more because I am in New York. And New York is probably one of the best places to do it, honestly. Any, any city, any street, and in the world. And I've also done a bit, you know, in Malta and uh, wherever I traveled. Um, but I seem to gravitate naturally to street photography. And it's just like beautiful just to be able to, especially now, like go out and t walk about and just take my camera and, and do it. I have another comment from Alexia. After all this is kind of over, what would you love to photograph and where? Good question. I'm actually um, working on a couple of projects. Um, I would definitely continue with the street photography. Hopefully I'll be back traveling. So I'm really looking forward to do some street photographies in other cities like Mexico City. Uh, I was in Colombia. I would like to go there again. Malta and go to, um, which is definitely different uh, from New York. And, um, but I'm also um, trying to educate myself and taking some courses on other genre of photography, uh, mainly on conceptual photography. And this is different because this is actually uh, kind of on the lines of fine art self-portraiture photography. So definitely different from street. Um, I always loved fine arts. I love arts in general. So I'm kind of starting to experiment in that area as well. 
So do you feel there, there were um, photographers or artists that influenced your photography style? Oh yeah, totally. Um, I, I definitely, uh, the, especially the 1950s and the 1960s uh, street photographers who were the ever so probably first three street photographers like Robert Frank, Vivian Mayer, um, I admire a lot, but I also admire the newer and more contemporary street photographers um, like Alan Scheller, the British um, guy who uh, taught me back in 2018 and, and others. But what I, what I do is I don't just look at other street photographers, both past, present. Um, I also look at um, artists and artists in the contemporary world. I gravitate toward, to, um, as I said, minimalism and shapes and forms. So like um, Kedensky and like Frank Stella, all those artists that use um, geometric patterns to execute a, a work of art or a piece of work, um, I, I really love. And um, I also started to follow and understand other types of photographers because of my new project who have done fine arts and self-portraiture. And uh, recently came across um, and studied, I'm studying a bit more um, Edward Weston, Francesca Woodman, and um, amongst other yeah, photographers and also artists. Like Hopper, as uh, Mary mentioned, is, is a favorite of mine just because of the solitariness around the art. So when, uh, after we've seen all this collection and are there other styles that you're working towards after this collection and project? Yeah, totally. Um, I actually have, a, I'm not sure we have, we have time, but I actually included a, a few kind of like shots on the stuff that I'm working right now. Um, also the more, um, actually I had another project on the sideline of the, the lockdown, which, um, was about the Broadway theater shows, um, which I captured every of the, every, each of the four to one Broadway theaters mm -hmm. in their current lockdown state, uh, which is fascinating. Um, but I, I, I did that. And then now I decided to, um, turn the camera onto myself. So I'm working on an introspective project and I'm again using photography to try to express uh, my feelings um, living alone and really living alone during the pandemic and being away from friends and family and also which includes the inability to, to travel and you know be free and mobile. So that's currently my, my current project and in, like an introspective. I have a comment here from Marianne. She said, congratulations, brava. <laughs> oh, thank you. So thanks for presenting that. And as you know, this is a Maltese series. So we always bring up um, about the Maltese connection. And if you want to just tell, even though we're a mixed audience, I think it's always yeah. good to bring up if you're Maltese or not. Um, uh, and we always enjoy hearing that and how you got here. And yeah, um, obviously the, the, the Maltese-ness in me is, <laughs> is probably what, again, makes me, uh, you know, creates my individuality, my uniqueness. And I always believe that what makes you also has an effect on what you create and what you make. Um, so I, I definitely want to continue being Maltese in, in every way I can. And I definitely miss the Maltese Center right now because, you know, I, I used to visit uh, on a regular basis and... You know, as I said, Carmen, I, I did the photography there for the events, even on a regular Sunday, just go there with my camera, eat a pastitsi and kinney. And I also loved um, hearing my language, talking my language. So that for me is, is, is all, you know, part of being Maltese, not just participating in the, in the center's events, which are also cultural. Um, so I am definitely looking forward to doing more of that and going back to shooting those events, attending those events. Because right now it's really feeling like um, I'm yearning even more for that because of, mm -hmm. of the situation that we're in right now. Um, not, to, not to mention obviously missing going to Malta and being with my family and friends back there. So, yeah. Okay, so um, I don't know if you wanted to show maybe a, a few photos that you've taken and then we'll, you know, sure. 
from aside from the collection you just shown here? Yeah, also, um, I was also thinking of maybe um, talking about the donation for mm -hmm. the Monty yeah, Center. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, if anyone is interested, I am offering one of my photos uh, in print and frames. Uh, this was shot in Ala Gozo back in summer 2019. And it was obviously the week of the village festa, as you can see with the, all the you know, uh, festivities going on. And um, if you would like to donate, you can go to the Moti Center website and just um, hit the donate button and this could be yours. <laughs> it's just another way to help the center because obviously we're going through um, a tough time right now um, because there are no events. Obviously there are no funds coming in for the multi center. So we're, we're trying obviously to help in every way. So this is my small contribution if anyone is interested. <laughs> oh, but you made many contributions. Your photos uh, are all on our website. It makes it look beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was taking those photos. It was so, it was really fun, actually. And challenging, too, because there's so many people. It's like, <laughs> for me, that was like the other spectrum. What so I really difference. kept me on my toes. Exactly. It really kept me on my toes. Um, so, yeah, if, if um, I could spend a another few minutes, if anyone still wants to say on, on the call, um, uh, I have a few shots here from my other projects. Um, which is also related to the pandemic. Um, it's called Curtain Down, and this was actually taken after lockdown. And these shots were taken through the summer. I believe I started this end of July until the beginning of September. So what this project was about, um, it, it, the actual focus was Broadway and its theaters. So um, it was funny, it's, it's like, uh, I was actually in conversation with, with Carmen here, and one day we met and she was telling me you know, how sad and miserable um, she was uh, with seeing Broadway in that state. You know, the theaters are all shut. There's no one around. Um, the, the streets are empty. The homeless are obviously around, but, you know, otherwise everything is shut. And I was really curious and I, I decided to start visiting the city and specifically visiting that area. And I honestly, I didn't know what to shoot and, and how to shoot, but I, I found myself just shooting these um, shots of each theater, you know, straight ahead. And I, I found myself literally going around and shooting all of the four to one Broadway theaters. It took me, as I said, almost two months. And I was going into the city about twice or three times a week because, I, you know, until I, I got the angle right, uh, I decided which camera, which lens to use. And the number of times, you know, there were cars parked maybe in front of the theater or a big moving truck. So you had to go back again and, and see whether, you know, the area was free because I really wanted to um, isolate the theater from everything else. So this is one of the four to one shots. And this is actually a majestic theater where the Phantom of the Opera was running for 31 years. <laughs> um, it's, Kind of motion to think about this, but like suddenly it stopped <laughs> because of the pandemic. And this is uh, Moulin Rouge. It had been running only like six months. It's a beautiful theater. I love the lighting. And unfortunately, not all of the theaters were still beautifully lit like this. So I had to struggle with those that were not lit. But other than that, I managed to capture each and every one almost like in this kind of isolated state. And as you can read here, there's a caption um, with the name of the theater and the performance that was last, the, the show that was last performing at the theater. Unfortunately, six never got to open at the Brooks Atkinson Theater. It was actually scheduled to open on the 12th of March. I think the, the premiere had been done, but it would never open to the public and it's still shut. This is the beautiful music box. I love the facade of the music box, um, which, uh, which dear Evan Hansen was performing. And this is the Broadhurst Theater with Jagged Little Pill. Yeah, Diana, another unfortunately show which um, had been scheduled for the 12th of August, 2020, but never opened. Aladdin or oh, at the New Amsterdam Theater had been running six years. 
And this is uh, Harry Potter at the Lyric Theater. Again, I love, the, I love what it says on the scaffold. Yeah, the story continues it, it on just, Broadway. Uh, yeah, the story continues on Broadway. Yeah, really um, uh, encompasses what we're going through. We're yeah, for that. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait until the curtain is is up again. Um, but I, I, I basically have a collection of. Uh, of all the theaters and I edited in a very uniform manner. Um, I just really, as I said, wanted to kind of show it's, the state of the theater. Yeah, and it's real lockdown, it's shut down way. It's, it's, it's so orderly. Mm. We know how Broadway is. I mean, there's always this energy, um, a fun kind of chaos that happens in Broadway and it's yeah. completely wiped out. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's haunting. Yeah, you know, it's, it's hard yeah. to put words to it. Um, and the emotions that we feel, even if we weren't theater goers, we know Broadway and we know what it is and what it means mm -hmm. in New York. Exactly. As you say, Carmen, and that's what I, I hope to have conveyed with this mm -hmm. project, the isolation, the abandonment, um, the loneliness of each of the theaters. And um, yeah, it was quite a challenge. They look very simple, straightforward shots, but honestly it was quite a challenge to shoot mm -hmm. all of these. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm glad I managed and I'm glad I did. And in the hope that one day, you know, looking back at this um, project and this, you know, these four to one photos to say, wow, that really actually happened? Mm -hmm. That the theaters were shut and there was no one around? Um, yeah. Well, well, thank you, Nikki. Thank you, everyone, sure. for joining us. And thanks for participating. Sure. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your questions and thoughts. I appreciate it. And just so everyone knows, these and all the past shows we do here on Il Maltintana are always available on our website and YouTube channel. So you can always go back and take a look. And again, you can check out Nikki's Instagram account at Nikki. Conti.com, and I believe some some of your prints are available. If you are uh, DM'd, you can um, send her a message. If there's a particular photograph that you like, she does um, do prints. I actually own two of her pre-COVID era uh, photos, um, and as a New Yorker, I thoroughly enjoy them. <laughs> oh, yeah, everyone, thank you again. Thanks, Carmen, and thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye.